We can discover the patterns that the parts of a column make when viewed in a particular perspective, then drawing them becomes much easier. Knowing the patterns help us to anticipate, in fact, what we're going to see, and therefore to observe it more easily and more accurately, and then draw it much more accurately. So let's have a look at some of the perspective patterns rows of columns make. And for this video, I'll use Doric columns. So let's start. Columns are a great architectural feature and we come across them very frequently in grand architecture. But they do present some particular characteristics according to perspective, according to where we stand when we view them, which if we understand when we're drawing, makes it much easier to see the detail that we need to see in order to draw our columns accurately. And in this video, we're looking at Doric columns. The Doric order was the simplest in form of the three Greek architectural orders and this fine set of Doric columns line the entrance of the Scottish National Gallery in Edinburgh. But first, two words which will be convenient if we know used in talking about Doric columns. At the top of a column sits square pad as I think of it, but in fact the architectural word for this object is an abacus. Under the abacus, in Doric columns, sits a shape that looks something like this. And where the flat abacus is square, this flat shape is circular. And it's called the echinus. There is a noticeable line at the top of the Doric column, which is called the neck. And then we have the shaft of the column coming off it. So we have the square abacus at the top, we have the circular echinus next, and then the neck at the top of the shaft of the column. And a Doric column flares out slightly as it goes down. And it has no base. The base of the column sits flat on the ground. Let's look at some Doric columns in perspective. We can see here the abacus at the top of each of the columns, and we can see this round pad, the echinus, that sits between the abacus and the top of the shaft. Because columns are round, and because the echinus is round, it doesn't matter from which angle we view it, it's looking the same. But the square pad of the abacus sitting at the top of our column very much changes shape, depending where we see it. And it's learning to recognize this pattern that makes it easier to draw the columns more accurately. But first, We'll note how foreshortening affects a row of columns. Foreshortening is the perspective principle that the further away an object becomes, the more visually compressed it becomes. So this column is narrower than this column. It's more compressed visually because it's further away than this column is to us. And the spaces between the columns also compress. They also appear to become narrower as they move further away from us. Even though we know the columns are all the same width and the space between the columns is the same. But because the columns are round, while they become narrower as they move away, the shape stays the same. However, the important thing is to observe how the abacus changes shape as the columns move further away. And to do that, we'll get a little bit closer to some Doric columns. We're still in Edinburgh here. This is one of the city's grand 19th century follies built to look like a ruined Greek temple. It gives us a great view of the echinus sitting on top of the shafts. And we know that these pads are the same size and they sit over the column. But what's important to note is a pattern. And it's this pattern that we need to remember because once we remember the pattern, we'll see it and seeing it we'll be able to use it to draw more accurately. And the pattern is to do with where the corner of the abacus is. So here we have the corners of the abacus. And I want to measure exactly where they sit over the column. And in this closest column, 
we can see that the corner of the abacus is, if you like, four flutes along, the left-hand side of four of these little curved vertical sections in the shaft of the column. But if we look at the corner of the abacus on the furthest column, we can see that it's almost on the very edge of the column. And of course, the differences spread on the columns before. So on this column, there's basically one and a half flutes. And on this column, there's two and a half flutes to the right of the abacus corner. Whereas here, we're looking at four flutes to the side of the abacus corner. So knowing that when I'm drawing, if I position the corner of the first column accurately, I know that as I move along, I know I need to slide that corner slightly to the right or to the left as I draw it. Now this also means that the right hand edge of the abacus will overhang more and more as it moves further away from us. The other important thing to notice is that the abacus overhangs the actual corner of the building. The other important thing to notice with the abacus and perspective is how the sides of the abacus follow the perspective lines established by the overall orientation of the building itself. Here we have eye level on the yellow line and we can see that if we draw these four lines and keep drawing them that they will in fact join quite some distance off camera to the left on the yellow line. We can also see here the principle that the closer the abacus is to us, the steeper the perspective angle will be. And as the abacus moves further away, the angle becomes flatter and flatter. Here we have another view of the same structure in a different perspective. This is almost one point perspective. And so the perspective lines combine in one vanishing point behind our object. And if we use these colored strips of paper to measure the angles of the left hand side of the abacus, we can see that they are all very different angles, but we see the same pattern of the side edges of the abacus following the perspective lines. And so if I were drawing this colonnade, once I'd drawn this angle, I know that all the other sides of my abacus have to slowly get more upright and then they begin to tilt more as they move further away from the center point in front of me. And if we just quickly have a look at where the corners are of our abacus, Again, we can see the pattern that we talked about where the corners of the abacus can go from being in the center of the column to not being over the shaft of the column at all. And between here and here, the corner shifts bit by bit. And if we see this pattern, it becomes much easier to draw accurately. Again, if at the start of our drawing, we observe where the horizontal straight line is, and then we look up the top and get a sense of how curved does that line become at its most extreme. And then we can spread that curve across all the lines as we go up. Now we'll put some of these patterns of perspective of columns into practice. And of course, it's particularly important that all the elements of columns that line up on the horizontal plane follow the same perspective lines that the other lines in the building follow, particularly the top of the abacus, because it's a fairly strong visual point. I position these columns largely by drawing the gaps between them rather than the widths of the column, because I find that's more helpful in getting the foreshortening correct. And once I've positioned the columns fairly accurately, I can use them then to reference the other parts of the building, particularly anything that's above the columns. And so this pediment, I note that the, the apex of the pediment is actually on the left hand side of the third column from the left. And so I use that point to position the apex and to get it in the right spot, which is often tricky because we're often more tempted to put it in the center of our straight line, whereas the angle makes it look further back. 
and then I do some hatching and cross hatching in the space behind the colonnade to bring the columns out more and that lets me have a better look at my spacing and at the columns and then I do just enough detail and I put a couple of figures at the end for scale. G'day I'm Stephen Travers. Complex architecture has so many elements to it that if we have to look at each one individually really carefully and draw it separately from the one next to it it becomes both very laborious and very difficult to become accurate in. But if we can learn to see the patterns that perspective makes with a row of identical elements all lined up together, then it becomes so much easier to see what we're looking at. And the more easily we see it and take it in and understand it, then the easier it is for us to draw it accurately. I see so many drawings where small parts of the drawing are accurate for a certain perspective, but they don't go with other parts of the drawing in respect of the right perspective. And you have these little sections where the patterns don't join together, where they don't align. And that's when we can sense that something's wrong, even if we can't work out exactly what it is. And because columns have many parts, and there are often many of them lined up very closely together, we want to get their alignment of all of their various components correct for the perspective that we're drawing them in. But if we understand the patterns that the different parts of a column form, it's not nearly as difficult. And lining them up accurately always adds, I think, a nice sense of drama to our drawing. So I hope this helps you with columns in general, but Doric columns in particular. So why not give it a go? And of course, make sure you have fun. I'll see you next time. Bye.